นโมทัสสะมะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะมะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะมะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะบุตรังธรรมังสังฆังคนุตรังอุปัชยังนามาสามิ In my previous talk, I briefly referred to Sherlock Holmes, and I'd like to mention him again this evening. There's a story: Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson, his sidekick. Uh, went on a camping tour, and in the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes woke Doctor Watson up. He said, "Watson, what can you deduce about our present situation? What do you see? What can you deduce?" And so Doctor Watson said things like, "Well, from the position of the stars in the sky, I would say it was such a such a." Um, Time of the night, from the particular configuration of the moon, it's uh, so much. So, what moon of the uh, day of the moon it is, and there's a, a wind coming up from the east, and and so he's coming up with all these kind of um, deductions, looking up the sky, you know? and and Sherlock Holmes was saying, no, no, no. So what is it, um, Sherlock? What is The deduction: Somebody stole in our tent. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I tell you this story other than to make you laugh? Well, um, the reason the reason being that um, I'm going to give a, a more kind of traditional um, dhamma talk this evening and go through the seven qualities. Yes, the seven s a p r i s a d h a m m a s Uh, these are seven qualities of a wise person, and um, they start off with uh, two qualities which make a pair, and they are atta and t a m m a which um, can be explained in a number of ways. But I'm going to present them in terms of methods, techniques, and goals or results. So, a wise person. Uh, knows the techniques, knows the methods, and he knows the goals and he knows the results. So he knows what uh, he needs to do or she needs to do to get the results that he or she is aiming at, and he knows what causes and conditions have led up to the present situation, for instance. But to begin with, I want to talk about. Uh, methods and techniques, um, because we are in a uh, we are living in an age obsessed with technique, and whether it's in worldly pursuits or in t a m a practice, uh, we tend to believe that success will be achieved um, through accumulating. All the necessary information to having very precise um, and comprehensive explanations of technique, and when we encounter difficulties in our life in our meditation practice, the natural assumption is that our technique is faulty, or there's some kind of Secret or esoteric tweak, which will be like the magic key uh, that opens the uh, the door to liberation. So we 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 conceive of spiritual life as being um, a an application of techniques and one in which there are magic keys, magic bullets, and Special esoteric pieces of knowledge, which somebody has somewhere, which will make it all a lot easier than it is right now. 
Now, um, I don't agree with this um, way of looking at things particularly, and that was why I started off with this story, because Dr. Watson's techniques and deductive abilities were very well honed, but he was missing um, the most important point being that only because there was no canvas um, between his eyes and the sky was he able to make all those deductions. So the, he was overlooking the supporting conditions for his deductions or for the application of the intellectual techniques which he was skilled in. So in meditation practice, I think that we can overlook the creation of the necessary supportive conditions for their successful application. Now, what are these? Well, there are many. For one, to begin with, um, in every meditation session, it is important to have a clear understanding of the goal of meditation. And that means both in the, um, the short term, in that particular meditation session, and um, also in the, in the long term, or the ultimate goal of Nibbana, what exactly that might mean. So this is why these two... Uh, these uh, two qualities, atta and dhamma, form a pair because the, the dhammas, the, the methods, the techniques are applied in light of the atta or of the results and they have to, that result has to be borne in mind as a guide for the application of techniques. Um, but it's not only the presence of an understanding of the goal of practice, but um, looking and um, exploring what exactly enables us or helps us to apply techniques um, and what prevents us or hinders us from doing so. So number one, of course, is wanting to. Do you want to apply your meditation technique throughout the 30, 40 minutes or 60 minutes of the meditation? This is not uh, such a silly question as it might seem. We say, well, well, if I didn't want to do it, I wouldn't be sitting here in the first place. But that's not necessarily the case. And this uh, wise desire or chanda or Dhamma Chanta is absolutely necessary for the successful application of effort. There are two kinds of desire spoken of by the Buddha, unwholesome desires, which he called Tanha, which are the outgrowth of ignorance, um, lack of true understanding or wrong understanding. And there is Chanta, which is the kind of desire that arises from uh, knowledge, true understanding. So it, this is a very important point to, to remember. The Buddha did not castigate all kinds of desire, uh, but only those that arise from ignorance. So you see somebody suffering and in pain, and, you, uh, and the desire arises to help them, that is most definitely not the kind of desire um, that the Buddha told us to abandon, on the contrary. So um, in meditation, we have to want to meditate more than we want to allow our minds to indulge in memory and imagination. And we have to be very honest with ourselves at the beginning of a meditation session, whether or not 
our mind is ready and interested and enthusiastic about the application of our meditation technique. If it's not, if one part of our mind is, oh, it's time to meditate, this is what I usually do now, um, is accompanied by a lingering desire just to think about the past, think about the future, um, ponder some particular problem, um, issue, or just to um, indulge in fantasies, then uh, it won't be successful. Even though you've learned by heart all the techniques, you've heard all the teachings, um, if, you, if you have a, um, a wonderful car, but you, you, know, you don't ever go and sit in it, and you don't turn the engine on and drive it, well, it, it, it's, um, it's, you have a car, but you might as well not have it at all. So, at the beginning of a meditation practice, be willing to spend a little time talking to yourself. And how do you talk? You talk to yourself in ways that are going to bring up this um, interest and enthusiasm for meditation. And um, you can experiment with various ways of doing that maybe reflecting on the virtues of the Buddha or the teachings or the Sangha, um, great meditators, uh, people who you find uplifting, inspiring figures that you think of them and, you've, and your mind becomes filled of reverence and devotion. These are positive, uh, positive emotions that can be brought into our mind through um, certain reflections, or we might reflect on on death and how how short and uncertain our life is, and how fortunate we are to have this opportunity to practice so there won 't be one particular reflection which will work every time that you feel a little lazy or heedless or unmotivated, but this is one of the the skills that the meditator develops. Um, he looks on his or, or she looks on her mind just as the way a loving parent looks at a child um, and knows that you can't be harsh with a child all the time, but every now and again you do have to be a little harsh. And you can't be kind to the child all the time, um, but um, you do, you are, generally um, act in a kind way. The idea is that you're looking what is in the best interests of the child at any given moment. And that's the way you start to look at your mind, what's in the best interests of your mind. How do you need to think? How do you need to approach what you're doing to create the supporting conditions, particularly in the realm of motivation, and the emotional states um, which will sustain a meditation practice throughout its whole duration, not just uh, starting off and, and sort of quite enthusiastic and then the mind starts to wander a little bit and then just gets bored or gives up. Um, that um, is exactly what we're practicing meditation to overcome in the first place. So we're learning life skills through meditation. Um, it's not that we're trying to escape from certain negative mental states by uh, finding some way into a peaceful, secluded mental state as a kind of um, uh, temporary refuge. But we're learning the quality, how to develop the qualities of mind that will allow us um, to deal constructively and wisely with all mental states that may arise. We're talking about this just now. Sometimes lay meditators 
in Thailand will say to me, um, I, I know I, I should meditate, but so I just sometimes I'm just so agitated and so upset, you know, it, it, I just can't meditate. And, and I say to them, this is like somebody with a serious illness saying, I'm just too sick to go and see the doctor. You know, you go to see the doctor when you're sick. Um, and when you most need to meditate, you know, is precisely when you don't want to. Um, because that's when you're developing the ability to bear with, to be patient with, and to learn the nature of negative emotions. When else are you going to be able to learn and to let go of these things if you're not doing it in your meditation period? So techniques are important, um, but we have to ask ourselves, am I in the right space? Am I, in, uh, am I sufficiently motivated, um, sufficiently well-directed to apply these techniques well and successfully? If I'm not, um, what would be a good reflection to use um, to bring my mind to that state. Now, the, um, I, uh, I found that the, uh, an, an adaptation of the uh, Mr. Goenka's sweeping method um, to be very, uh, a very good introduction um, to a meditation session and one that we can adapt to our needs. So um, for those of you not familiar with that, um, just being, it's a kind of a warm-up exercise for mindfulness, um, just to get into your, get into the mood, as it were. So what you do is you bring your attention to the sensations on the top of your head and what's there, not um, speculating about it or worrying about it, but just being present to whatever sensation um, appears there. And then what, uh, looking and being aware of whatever sensation is in the face, then in the neck, in the shoulders, the arms, the hands, the fingers, the chest, the belly, the back, the buttocks, the legs, the knees, calves, the ankles, toes, uh, feet and toes. So your body gives you um, a set, uh, clear-cut progression, something for your mindfulness to follow step by step, point to point, from head to toe. Now, you can use that, um, we're talking techniques here, you can use that as um, simply a mindfulness exercise to bring awareness to all the parts of the body uh, which you um, may well not um, be directly aware of. Um, and in, it's incredible um, the extent to which in such a sensual and body-based culture um, how little direct awareness uh, we often have of what's going on in our body. Another, if you have a lot of pain or you're feeling very um, low, one way is to spread thoughts of loving kindness to each part of the body um, and developing uh, this very positive um, uh, attitude and stance towards your physical body. So if you have um, difficulty in spreading thoughts of loving kindness to yourself, as the person you think you are, then you start off very easily just sending loving kindness to your shoulder or your arms or your hands. And, and, and so you, you, the guiding principle in a lot of these meditations is always start from the easy or the easiest um, and move towards the more difficult. Um, if you're in a slightly different state of mind, um, a, an alternative is to develop this mindfulness step by step through the physical body 
and and to use allow your mind to think but think about all the illnesses that could arise in a, in each part of the body think of all the things that can go wrong with your eyes all the things that can go wrong with your nose all the things that can go wrong with your brain all the things that can go wrong with your teeth so you're giving your mind a certain license to think here but it's constrained within boundaries that you've clearly established and it is focused and directed um and it's you, this kind of reflection is good if you're in a very kind of um sensual exuberant outgoing um heedless kind of mind state when you sit down rather than just sort of struggling and fighting against it um and getting very frustrated you recognize yeah there's this kind of energy what's the skillful way of dealing with that and so that reflection on on all the illnesses and 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 problems that the human body uh, is heir to can just deflate that kind of heedless exuberant energy so it's always finding the right tool or the right medicine for the uh the present um imbalance or problem just um one more thought or one more um reflection on the on the point of technique and method and that is that when we have um a lot of agitation in the mind a lot of negative emotion then how do we deal with it now um when we have defilements and clouded emotions in our mind whatever kind it's it's is quite obvious to almost everyone that if we welcome those thoughts and and um become obsessed by them that our mind will never be peaceful that that i think is not the difficult point at all for anyone to grasp but the the trap that um, many people fall into is feeling that wanting to get rid of something um uh, provides the necessary motivation to do so but in the practice of meditation we soon realize that not wanting to have a particular mental state arising in the present moment um and trying to get rid of it um provides the very same function of fueling the flames of that mental fire um every bit as um powerfully as liking and indulging in the pleasure of those thoughts and memories and so on so the uh wise way is merely to recognize and neither to grasp onto or push away and merely recognize the exist and and in most cases that mere recognition of a thought as a thought of anxiety as anxiety of doubt as doubt of of anger as anger of depression as depression the mere recognition of something as just what it is is enough for that uh mental state to pass away um just as we shine a light in the darkness and anyone who's misbehaving just sort of like this like they were actually meditating or doing something serious and so you're shining a light in the darkness um in the case that 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 moment of mindfulness is not sufficient then you may need to apply particular antidotes but the um the the first um wise response must always be that of equanimity that's not the end um of story in every case but it's def- definitely indispensable 
Now, one way of dealing with um, agitation um, in which you avoid that pitfall of aversion, which sometimes can be quite subtle, is to, if it's in, the, let's say, in the case of a, a, a verbal thought, mental activity is sometimes images, sometimes uh, words, and sometimes a mis- mixture of the two. Let's take the case of words in your mind. And so um, just this thought comes into your mind is, I wonder what time he's going to finish this talk. And then, and then, and so you catch yourself, you see. Um, And when you catch yourself, it says, don't think like that. That's not a good thing to think. That's not very respectful, you see. And then you're just um, making it worse. But when you recognize a thought in the mind, Consciously continue the thought. Consciously continue the sentence that you're thinking, but in slow motion, just very slow. Mm. So you're thinking, I wonder what time, when you realize, and then, and then you think that he will finish this talk. You see, you think like this consciously. So you're not saying, get out of my mind. I don't want to think like this. It's not very good. I'm supposed to be meditating or whatever. But uh, you recognize it and you allow it and you think, but in this very artificial, slow motion kind of way. And before very long, um, incredibly quickly, you just get bored. Um, So... um, this is this is a very good meditation for people in the present day who are, whose boredom threshold is extremely low. Um, so rather than being the enemy, um, you can make use of this easily bored personality that you have to get bored with what you're thinking about. So you allow yourself to think, and then you can just follow it and be totally mindful and present to the thought, um, but making it slow motion. A visual analogy or a visual alternative here is as you're thinking thoughts which are words in your mind, then you visualize them as words written with a stick in water. Again, because you know and you have this memory of what happens when you write in water, it takes over. It's not something you're doing. The, the thoughts just dissolve in the water automatically. So you're taking away this idea of me trying to stop myself thinking. So this, this is the um, uh, realm of technique. And I'm probably not going to get all through all these seven qualities because I've hardly started and we could go all night, but I'll try and speed up now. Um, a point about atta or goal. If, let's, uh, I give you another image or analogy, you're swimming across a lake and your goal is a tree on the other shore. <laughs> so those of you who are swimmers, try to imagine um, how you would swim towards that tree. Now, if you're looking up like this, trying to watch, keep, see where the tree is all the time, you're not going to swim very well, and it's going to take you forever to get there, and it's going to feel even longer than forever, subjectively, because, of course, it's just not getting any closer, any closer. So what does the wise swimmer do? The wise swimmer puts his effort into swimming, and every now and again, he just bobs his head up, and just to check whether he's still in line with the tree. And this is how you meditate. You have a goal, you have a, um, something that you're aiming towards, but you don't keep your mind on it all the time. Um, but every now and again, you just check whether or not what you're doing right now is calibrated with that, uh, the process which is going to lead you to your goal and whether you're going in the right direction or not. 
Okay, so that's up and tam. Uh, what's the next one? Don. Uh, you need to know yourself. And so what does that mean? You know, self should be the refuge of self. You know, people read this thing. I thought Buddhism was all about anatta and not self. What's all this stuff about self? And um, So these are two different levels. The conventional level means being realistic, not being I- too idealistic and refraining from the word should and should not whenever possible. These are poisonous words. I should be, I should not be, he should be, she should be, it should be, it should not be. These are, um, uh, these are words arising from habit um, and mental laziness. So um, be mindful and try to find alternative ways of looking at your experience without using those words. So a lot of um, religious traditions and philosophies um, depend on these a lot. They say, you should be like this. A good person is like that, you see. And then you read this, and it's very inspiring, but then you realize you're not the kind of person that you're supposed to be. And the what is um, the end result of a teaching telling you how you should be and your recognized inability to be that kind of person? And the answer is guilt. Um, so we have guilt-ridden societies where people um, are so upset that they can't be the kind of people that they think they should be. So we don't need to um, follow that path at all. Now, we recognize, you know, try to look, well, how are we right now? Even meditators can get this. I've been meditating for X number of weeks, months, years. Therefore, I should be more wise, more peaceful, more this, more that than I am. And so um, the, the best, very simple um, mantra uh, to use with this is, why not? Why shouldn't you be? Why, uh, you say, I should be, why should you be? On what ground should you be, given all the causes and conditions that have led up to this particular situation? So don't follow that one. Um, I have my favorite story of um, someone who knows themselves is, of course, Ajahn Chah. Story being, one you may well be familiar with, as a young monk, he was um, on Tudong, traveling through the countryside, walking. He stayed at a small monastery, and every day this young widow used to come to offer food and, of course, young widows can't come very close to young monks very easily. So um, this young widow, very intelligent, she had a very young son. And so she would have a young son who was very sweet and charming, as young boys and girls can be, um, to, to go and offer things. And, and so created this kind of relationship. Um, and then one night, in the middle of the night, Ajahn Chah woke up, his lay attendant, and he said, get your stuff together, we're leaving. And Ajahn Chah ran away. He ran away because he recognized he wasn't confident that he had the strength um, to withstand the temptations that he was feeling at that particular moment. So he swallowed his pride. He said, yeah, um, I'm just not sure I can handle this very well. So we have this teaching of bearing with things and never giving up and so on, but it has to be balanced with wisdom by this recognition of our own limitations, not saying we should be this way. If we're not, then we recognize that and very humbly 
uh, make the necessary um, adjustments. And that might mean uh, a tactical withdrawal, or it might mean um, some people looking at us somewhat askance, but never mind. There is a recognition of what we, right now, what we can and can't do. We're not saying we are this way um, uh, and we'll be this way always, but right now, this is how things are right now. Now, um, I, um, I think, just, just one more point on this uh, virtue, and that is that there is a natural tendency for us to give exaggerated time to those things that we're good at and to neglect those things that we're bad at. And that's fair enough. We, we do need that sense of self-respect, self-esteem that comes uh, from accomplishment, even in quite mundane matters. But at the same time, we have to be very careful of to know ourselves and know when we're being dishonest with ourselves or whether we're just trying, um, we're uh, avoiding um, discomfort or an unwillingness to, uh, to learn and to be with certain things and turning more and more to uh, what's pleasant and the things that we're, that we're good at. And if you, if you um, I've practiced um, yoga since I was a teenager and I know that even because there are so many yoga exercises that um, you can do, and it's not there's not a fixed sequence. Now I've noticed in certain periods of my life that I tend to um, do the ones that I can do well, and the ones that I can't do well, I don't do so much. And that's just one uh, one small example that I'm sure we all have. Oh, I'm not that kind of person. I can't I can't do this very well. One of my um, friends and um, uh, mentors of very early years in uh, in Thailand, he was the first monk I met at Wat Pong, the first Western monk I met, and I, I considered him the most humble, self-effacing human being I'd ever met, and someone who was uh, quite willing to say, no, I can't do this, or no, I'm, I'm no good at this. And I found this um, quite inspiring, until at a certain point I realized um, that he would only, in his life, he would only ever um, do things that he was confident he could do well. Uh, he just couldn't handle the humiliation of being a failure or a loser. He couldn't face possible criticism from others for doing a bad job. So his life became rather constricted that he, he would only be willing to put in effort into things that he could do well. So in this case, um, I would say that you know, he didn't um, really know himself well enough. And, and so you know, um, recognizing on the mundane level your strengths and weaknesses and not taking them as indicators of who you really are, but these are just the, uh, the results of accumulated habit, um, perhaps of only this lifetime, but it could be of many lifetimes. But in the end, um, these, all, all we can see is just habit. It's just habit energy. And you can change habits, but if your mind is into a deep rut, you can't expect to change a habit overnight. It will take some time, but it can be done. Next one is knowing the right amount. And this means knowing the right amount in food, knowing the right amount of exercise, uh, knowing the right amount of time that you spend in different activities, how much time you spend on Facebook, how much time you spend on your computer, how much your time you spend watching the television, how much time you spend meditating. And um, if you spend a lot of time on the computer and a lot of time on the TV, you may well find you don't have very much time to meditate at all. Um, so um, what's the right amount in everything? This is podi, the, the, 
the middle way. A lot of misunderstanding about the middle way, and whenever anyone wants to justify their own position, they'll tend to take two things on either side of them and try and tell you that it's the middle way. So you have to be very careful of that when other people tell you they're on the middle way or when you tell yourself or others that you're on the middle way. So, for instance, if you have someone who's never never even hit somebody um, in their life, uh, never been violent, and you have another person who's a serial killer, you know, like, what's the middle way? Uh, Well, you say, well, I'll only kill someone if I'm really, really angry. Uh, So, you know, that's, you know, like an obvious example of a a false middle way. The middle way, uh, just as I was speaking about um, ends and means, techniques and, and goals and so on, the middle way can only be understood um, when you have a goal. My, my favorite example of this is if you're, somebody says, I'm, uh, I want to go um, to Alaska. Um, if I drive um, towards, where? towards uh, Portland, would I be going in the right direction? And you could say, yes. Okay, no question, immediately. If you're going in a northerly direction, you've got a good chance to get more or less up there sooner or later. But let's say in the second case you say, I just like to go for a nice drive. Um, if I turn left and, and uh, go north towards Portland, would that be the right direction? So now you can't give the same emphatic, unequivocal answer because you don't have a goal in mind. You say, I just like to go for a nice drive. Well, you could go north and have a nice drive, you could go east, you could go whatever direction. Um, so the, the answer to the question, is this right or is this wrong, is this appropriate or is this not, um, can only be answered really when you have a goal. So the goal of, uh, in Buddhism, is the complete eradication of dukkha and its cause and the, um, uh, the perfection of wisdom and compassion. So therefore, the middle way in practice in whatever area um, is the optimum practice, whether it's in the level of conduct, of, of samadhi, samadhi, of wisdom, whatever we're doing, it's the optimum uh, amount which will lead towards um, the goal in which we are um, the, uh, that we are pursuing or following. So it's not just halfway between this extreme and that extreme. And so middle way can, can change a lot uh, over the course of a person's day or year, something that um, at one particular period in your life might seem to be um, too strict or too tough, that another period of life might be just the optimum, might be just the middle way for you at that time. So you have this sense of what keeps you on the middle way towards um, the goal um, in which that you are aiming for. So having a sense of um, what's enough, what's the right amount, And on the worldly level, of course, very important in this world which is constantly telling you what more is better. And um, something to observe is that there's so much choice in the world these days, ten different kinds of bagel and whatever. Um, Now, if you have ten choices, you can only have one. So if you accumulate all the good points of the nine that you've rejected, they're probably going to exceed the good points of the one you've chosen. So this is why, you know, you constantly feel you're missing out because every time you make a choice, you've rejected so many interesting and delicious things. Um, So uh, be aware of that. You say, this is good enough. You know, this... um, and, and that um, not making that comparison, not adding up all the positive qualities of things that you haven't had. But um, if there's one teaching from, my, from the 
um, my own childhood and, and um, somewhat patchy Christian upbringing, in which I um, still make use of, count your blessings. Absolutely essential. Count your blessings. And um, enjoy uh, what you're with or the one you're with. Um, that's, um, that's Brahman. Don Brahman. Gone. The next one. Uh, the next one is time and place, knowing time and place. Um, ripeness is all, said Shakespeare. And that sense of when is the right time and place to do things. Now that you need um, a certain amount of patience and mindfulness there, because if you're someone who just reacts blindly to situations and people's actions and words then your sense of time and place um, is not going to be very developed. The, recently, um, the Catholic Church um, did a long-term survey. I'm not sure whether it's only amongst um, members of the church or generally as to what personality types were most likely to get Alzheimer's. And the answer is um, people who have... Um, no ability to delay gratification or no patience, basically. Um, so if you're someone who thinks, that, thinks of something and just has to say it straight away, has to do it straight away, then um, you might lead a rather exciting life, but Alzheimer's is a depressing possibility in the future. The wise person says it's not worth it. So learning that sense of composure and not just being uh, a puppet and somebody says something and you react or does something and you react and without any kind of inner integrity, um, but developing uh, that composure. And then when there's mindfulness and there's a patience, then a sense of time and place. If somebody... If you're feeling really agitated and upset, then it's usually not the time to speak. If somebody insults you or misrepresents you, um, you know, what do you do? Well, it depends, doesn't it? Sometimes it might just be a matter of being very patient and allowing the situation to unfold and for time uh, to be the test in other uh, on other occasions, it might be necessary to um, to inform certain people of the true facts of the case. There's no, in so many um, situations,